This is the Powerlifting America podcast, and today we've got an interview with the 47 kilo queen, Heather Connor, who is nine days out from competing at Powerlifting America Nationals on February 24th. Heather is a multi-time world champion who always tells you exactly what she's thinking. She's extremely generous in giving back to the sport and making time for podcasts like this. So make sure you listen all the way through this two hour long interview with one of the best that powerlifting has to offer. Before I bring Heather in, I wanna remind you that Powerlifting America Nationals will be streamed live on the SPD Apparel YouTube account. Thank you to SBD and Aleko for their continued partnership with Powerlifting America. If you're looking to compete in drug tested powerlifting, whether you're just starting out or you want to compete with the best in the world, make sure you go to powerlifting-america.com, become a member, check out our event page for all of our upcoming events. And we even have a store where we're selling merch like this nice hoodie. All right, now let's get to the interview with Heather. All right. What's up, Heather Connor? Welcome to the Powerlifting America podcast. Hey. I just got a notification that was like, you were recording, which I knew you were. Um, and it even gave me the option to leave. So if I thought that was weird, I could have just. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for staying. Uh, <laughs> appreciate you <laughs> not ghosting me in the middle of our, our scheduled Zoom call. Um, but Not after you. Valentine's Day. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Happy belated Valentine's Day. Thanks, you too. And um, congratulations, you're the second guest on Power of the America's podcast. So it's like it's one, of the high, one of the highest honors. You were the first one scheduled, um, but then Waskar slipped in there in the in-between time. So I understand. Sadly. So you can you can beat him up at uh, in Austin if you want. I mean, we're almost the same weight. Exactly, exactly. No offense. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be a fair fight. Let me just say we're both smaller individuals. I got yeah. him. It'll be a fair fight, I think. So, okay. Um, for people who don't know, you know, you're Heather Connor, you're the 47 kilo queen. Um, you're a multi-time world champion. How many times have you won a world championship? Two? Was, yeah, two. two. Two? Okay. No. Two. Yeah, two. Yeah, I think two. <laughs> and I mean, you, yeah. got, you got robbed out of one, um, you know, with COVID and everything like that. But, um, yeah, cool. that was so, rough. <laughs> yeah, that was rough. Um, and, but you know, most people kind of, you've been on a lot of podcasts, like people know your story, people, if you're in the sport of powerlifting, you don't know who Heather Connor is like, definitely like just turn this off and go Google powerlifting and you should find her, um, learn about the sport and you'll definitely find Heather Connor. Um, you were one of the first people that, that I came across in the sport and just looking at your open powerlifting, you've been competing since 2014. Yeah. Which I don't even count that one because like, well, I should count it, but yeah. technically I can't because I did bomb out and I oh. kind of use that story as an example, right? Okay. Um, I didn't even know the rules going into this. I got asked like three weeks prior to it actually happening because some people at my gym had a team, somebody dropped out, they wanted that spot filled. So I was like, cool. They didn't even tell me the rules, nothing. Wow. So I just thought I had to be the strongest competitor there. So, um, I went in, I weighed in with my singlet on my hoodie on my shoe, like the works, the absolute works. And, um, apparently you're not supposed to do that. I mean, it's cool if you do, but you probably shouldn't. <laughs> and I bombed out on bench. I just was like, what are commands? Like, what do you mean? I got to pause it on my chest. Um, but I do like to use that story as an example, like, yeah, you might have not done your best at this competition, but there are so many more left in you. You don't even know what that next competition is going to bring. So just like, don't, don't yeah. give up on yourself. Too yeah. Quick. I mean, actually, that's interesting that you mentioned because I didn't actually look at the results um, yeah. for that. I just looked at the date. It was 2014. And I mean, of course, then you went on to be like one of the most storied competitors yeah. in all of powerlifting, you know, one of the most famous people in the world of powerlifting, one of the most successful. So it is a great story. Heather Connor bombed out of her first meet on bench, not on bench depth, but just on, no. bench, on bench commands. <laughs> so that's cool. That's inspired. That's really inspiring for other people. I also see it's like one of the only times that you weighed in above 47 kilos. Yeah. Um, so you'll see like that big significant difference again, weighed in with clothes. Um, you know, like I didn't, I didn't even like, I sat here, had like waffle house. Like <laughs> <laughs> I was just going about my regular business. Um, and I was like, 
oh man. And so then um, it came to like the 105 class, um, which a few weeks prior to me doing my next competition was actually when they did away with the 48 kilo class. Okay. Um, so I still competed as a 52, but like rather light. So I was like, well, I didn't know that. So I ate anyways, because I was well below 114 pounds. Um, but yeah, like that was an eye opening experience for me because as a junior, um, I knew I had just bombed out of this past competition, but there were people there with me in weigh-ins saying like, oh my God, this, this girl is so strong. And I'm like, me? <laughs> like, are we at the same <laughs> competition? About? Like, who are we talking about? And I'll never forget when I got so mad that I bombed out on bench and Jen Thompson was trying to give me advice. And I was like, what does this crazy lady know about me? Oh, but my goodness. apparently she knows everything about bench. So um, I probably should have just put my anger and ego to the side a little bit. Um, also, after that competition, I was like crying at Apple um, Outback. I almost said Applebee's, but I was crying at Outback. And how embarrassing is that? Like, I know that waitress probably got secondhand embarrassment. And my dad was sitting there with me. He's like, well, um, you can just do another one. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> right now I'm about to cry. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and yeah, that second competition ended up um, breaking in some junior American records and then the very next one was a state championship where I was in the 47 kilo class. And that was my first open one. So okay. nice. Yeah. I mean, what a wild 2015 was wild. I mean, I did nothing with like knee sleeves, wrist wraps. I wore high socks the whole time. Wow. Um, still probably didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> that is just such a, I mean, it's crazy because that you've been on so many podcasts and things I've heard. I've listened to, I listened to all the power of team podcasts and um, try to get information everywhere about all the athletes. And I've never heard this story. And also I, how crazy that at your first or, or second meet, you meet Jen Thompson and she's like giving you advice on bench. Was it at the first meet when you bombed out that you met her? Um, I had met her briefly. Like she was working the, um, she was actually working the attempt table okay. and I was like, I, I know I can push this way and I upped it. And she was like, are you sure? Like, you know, <laughs> yeah. I was like, yeah, I'm sure I've aggressively pressed this off my chest in the gym before. What do you mean? And, mm -hmm. um, so that second time after I missed my second attempt, um, I did listen and didn't bump it, but it didn't matter. <laughs> I just mm -hmm. wasn't strong enough. And it looks like in open powerlifting, at least, um, for your second meet, which was also in North Carolina, um, it looks like, you, did you just take openers and that was it? Um, it only, in open powerlifting, it only shows your opening. Um, so maybe they just only import. Oh no, that. I went nine for nine that day. <laughs> okay. Okay. Cause it that looks like really, you that was four. a really nice competition. There was a lot of nice people there. <laughs> okay, cool. Wow. That's amazing. What, like, what a great, uh, backstory. So, okay. So for then let's fast forward. Because, um, you know, we could go through all of your meat history here, <laughs> yeah. which I would love to do, but, but, uh, you know, I want to respect your time and everything. Let's fast forward to, um, this last year and talk about, you know, you came into power of American nationals about a year ago, I guess it's only been actually about 10 months, yeah. um, since power of American nationals last year was in April. Um, and you know, you, you won your weight class pretty easily. You didn't have to do anything too hard. And then you're pre set up to basically have a really great prep, which you did have going into South Africa. So then, <laughs> so kind of tell us a story about, so I know, all right, I'll preface this because I, because, you know, I'm in the group, <laughs> I'm in the group chat and I know <clears throat> first tell us before we get into the story of, of like what happened in South Africa and on the way there and everything, how was the prep going leading into it? The prep was going amazing. Yeah. If I had to guess it is one of my like top three best preps of going into a competition. I mean, I felt immaculate. I felt strong. Like I felt confident and, you know, I just, the only thing that was annoying were the regulations to get there. But as far as performance wise, like I was super confident. Like I felt it in my bones. Like I remember having a conversation, like I knew it was going to come down to that final deadlift. I knew it. And I knew I was going to pull something big because I had just 
over and over in the gym. I had pulled 200 kilos. Like I knew it was there. And, uh, so <laughs> leading to South Africa, um, typically lifters will get there about two days prior to a competition. I, on the other hand, had to get there five days prior. That was my goal. Um, I do have a very drastic autoimmune disorder, um, which I found out about earlier in the year of, or the year prior in November, when I went over to Ireland and realized um, there's no way I can get to another country in two days without being aggressively sick the whole time. Um, so what most people don't know with this autoimmune, it doesn't matter if I am in the sky or I'm in the ground, like if there's like a change of elevation, anything like that, my ears get really, really bad. I have tubes in them now. It's awesome. But I will immediately get sick and I'll be sick that entire day going into the next day. Mm -hmm. Like just recently going to Pennsylvania, I yeah. was like, I need you to pull over immediately. Cause I was like getting sick. <laughs> <laughs> um, so because of that, I try to get there five days early so I could let my body get over being sick and try to kind of like regain that strength back by food and whatever I needed to, uh, mm -hmm. after those two days. So that would have given me three days to really prepare. Okay. Yeah. And then, so I know, I mean, you were doing your due diligence, like you said, like people who, who are listening to this in the future, you know, we had this global pandemic and then it was really difficult to travel and there was all these regulations and stipulations. Um, so it was a big hassle to even just plan to get to South Africa. Yeah. And then, um, you know, on traveling and everything on the way there. Now I heard the rumor was, was that like Delaney Wallace was supposed to pick you up and take you to the airport and then he just ghosted you or wait, or did he drop you off at the wrong airport or it was something that it was all his fault, right? It was literally, I can make up a million ways that he messed up. Um, but <laughs> what it comes down to, it was definitely his fault. Yeah, it was hundred percent Delaney's <laughs> You fault. know what, as much as I joke about it, he did have people approach him at worlds. Cause mind you, he left after me, but still got there before me. Yeah. <laughs> like most people did. Mm -hmm. Um, and like, I'm joking around about it on the social media because I'm coping. Um, that's what I do. And people came up to him at worlds and really thought that he just forgot me at the airport. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. He's such a sweetheart. I'm sure he took it all with in stride. Yeah. <laughs> So, okay. So, so tell us really what happened since, since we know that Delaney would never ghost you like that. He would never ghost me. So, okay. It's, we're five days out, right? Yeah. We're five days out. I would have gotten there, um, with four and a half days of spare essentially. And so I'm at the airport and I start seeing these delays, delay, delay. And I'm like, Mm, that something's not sitting like something just was not sitting right in my gut. And I had already had arrangements for my family to, you know, watch my pets and everything like this. And I, I made the phone call and I was like, do you think I should just like go home and like try again tomorrow? Because there's just like a lot of delays and I'm worried I'm not going to make my connecting flight. Mm -hmm. So I was going from North Carolina up to Newark, New Jersey. And from Newark, I was having a direct flight to Johannesburg, South oh, cool. Africa. Cool. That would have been perfect on paper. It would have been perfect. Like literally my, I was flying into my gate in Newark and that's where I needed to be. I didn't even have to walk around to find the gate. I was flying right into it. Um, so they're like, no, 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 you, you should be fine. I was like, okay, well, like, are you sure? Cause now I'm second guessing everything. I even went to one of the flight associates and I was like, am I going to, am I going to miss my connecting flight? And he was like, no, no, like you are, you're absolutely fine. I'm like, this man don't even sound confident, <laughs> but I was like, okay, I'm not going to go home. So I get on this flight and we get there in time, but there was so much congestion in Newark that it took us two hours to get to our gate. So we're sitting on the runway for two hours and oh. my connecting flight leaves and yeah. I'm just like ain't no way ain't no way but but I try to be like a little bit um you know hopeful I said okay 
I'll go, I'll go reconnect my flight. I'll get it tomorrow and I'll leave Mm -hmm. and I'll leave. That's so I, I mean, I upgraded to the fancy seats. Mm -hmm. I upgraded to the fancy seats. Um, you know, the ones that have like the little curtain, like you do not disturb because I'm like, okay, if I'm going to go there, I'm going to go in style and I'm going to make sure I'm resting. Cause I said to myself, I still have four days out, you know, it's just, four yeah. days. um, so it was a later in the flight or later in the day flight. And I, I get there. Um, the hotel I stayed at was like super shady. Um, they didn't have, <laughs> they were still like heavily under COVID regulations. So they didn't have like any actual breakfast. So I had a door dash some in and it was very mid. Um, but that's besides the point. Like, mm-hmm. I'm just really excited about my seat. <laughs> like that's yeah. what I was looking forward to. So I get back to the airport um, and I am just, you know, I'm getting snacks. I'm getting melatonin. I'm making sure I'm going to be in heaven. And they keep delaying the flight. And this one was right from Newark to Johannesburg. It was the exact flight I had the day prior. Mm -hmm. So that flight keeps getting delayed. And I'm like, no, no, there's just, there's no way they can cancel this. And they kept telling us they cannot cancel international flights. Uh They didn't cancel it. They rescheduled it. They're like, oh, and I mean, this is midnight at this point midnight so everybody's mad my phone's at like two percent and I'm like nobody's helping nobody's helping um they weren't trying to get us any like hotel stay so that night I did in fact stay in the shadiest hotel probably in Newark New Jersey (laughs) and um I don't even remember the name because that's like a trauma response I'm just trying to forget it Mm -hmm. but like I couldn't call to book a hotel. I couldn't call to book another flight. So I had somebody else in my family do it because I'm just, I was over them. They, they were not helping nobody. I feel sorry for everybody there. Yeah. So I get to this hotel. Um, I'm making sure that every door is locked. Um, uh, windows, <laughs> it was bad. Yeah. Uh, it, even if they did have a gourmet breakfast, I didn't want it. Um, uh, <laughs> so gourmet. <laughs> yeah, gourmet. So I'm there like, I get to the hotel at like 1 30 in the morning. Um, so I don't get to sleep till like two something in the morning because I'm like, is my room going to get broken into you? I saw the people randomly sitting in the hallway weird. So it comes morning time. And, um, I did have a flight from Newark to Atlanta and from Atlanta to Johannesburg. And it was actually the flight that Mike and them were on. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, this will go great, you know? So I told myself, I'm like, all right, I still got three days to go. Like, it's fine. Mm -hmm. Everything is fine. And you know what? My following started going up on social media because I was posting about it. And I think people were just like enjoying my spiral. It, it (laughs) It was one of those things where it was like, it was entertaining and you, yeah. cause you were making it entertaining. You, like you were kind of rolling with the punches and definitely yeah. trying to like have a good spirit about it. And, and people were obviously, this was one of the biggest battles of worlds. Like everyone was talking about you versus Tiff. Right. So, so well, it was I, big, I think at this point, everybody was wondering if I was even going to make it. Yeah. I, it was yeah, like Heather versus Tiff. That was like the big story, but now yeah. it's Heather versus the skies. Is yeah. she gonna get there? Heather versus so. Newark airport. <laughs> So this, so I actually had a friend who saw I was in Newark and she's like, Heather, I will come pick you up. And even when she picked me up, she goes, what in the world? What are you doing staying here? I was like, girl, let's not ask those kind of questions right now. Um, I think I had a protein bar that morning because no, they didn't have anything like that. Mm -hmm. So this is when I get back to Newark airport. Um, and at this point, which most people didn't know, like you had to get like a COVID test, a negative COVID test, and it was only good for 48 hours. That's so right. at this point, my COVID test is out of time. Oh. It is out of time. And I had gotten there significantly early. Now I do have a COVID card and by South African regulations, that was enough. Okay. That was, that's all I needed. Mm -hmm. Um, 
But when I got to the check-in counter, because I had to show them these documents, um, there was nobody there. Like there was nobody besides me. There were workers, but nobody actually trying to fly. Cause again, I got there about three hours early. Um, so I went up to, I went up to the counter. I spoke to this man who was very, very rude. He was very, uh, demeaning. And I know it was because like, I was a smaller female. He won a big dude, but I made him feel big because of my stature. And I was telling him that per South African regulations, all I needed was my COVID card. And he did not like that. I knew information like that because he, he needed to be right. Mm -hmm. He wanted and needed to be right. And he was just on his computer and he, I, he was like, well, I'm looking at the regulations for this airline. I said, that is where I got all this information from exactly. <laughs> and so that set him off. Um, because he was very determined to have me go and take a rapid test. Mind you, I got there early just in case I did need to take that rapid test. So um, he was asking me for my IDs, everything like that. So I gave him my regular driver's license. I gave him my military ID. Like I gave anything that he could want. Here it is. Here's all my forms of identification. And he, he like throws my military ID back at me. And he's like, I don't, I don't care about this. Damn. This military stuff, I don't care about it. And I was like, that's no cool. way. That's so disrespectful because my all my family is military. Like, don't, don't. Now I'm getting angry because you just blatantly disrespect me and my family. And the whole so, military, really. Yeah. Like, so I, I can feel myself getting, like my body temperature is going up. I know if I'm not disassociating from this conversation, like, this is why I go to therapy because I know I can get like, but this is also why people get mad at airports because they're not being heard. Um, so this guy was like, you know what? I'm not even going to let you on this flight until you go get a rapid test. So at that point, like, again, I'm getting angry. I was like, let me go get this rapid test. So I'm waiting in line. They don't accept insurance. They only accepted cash. And mind you, I had pulled cash out for an exchange in South Africa. So I did have some on me and $500. Wow. And these people like these older, this older couple is like, you're not going to believe how much this is about to cost you. Holy. And they're like, well, you can get this receipt and we can refund you the money. I was like, yeah, I would like a receipt. Yeah. Now I'm like, here's all my spending money for South Africa. It's gone goodbye. Like it's gone. So, um, yeah, I, I had to wait over an hour for that rapid test to come back negative. So by the time I take it back down there to the, the desk, everybody in the entire world is waiting to check in. So I am at this point, I got like, and like 50 minutes to get through security and make it to that gate. And, um, I didn't see that like rude man there anymore. So I was like very hopeful. And then I see, like, I took advantage of the situation. I ain't gonna lie. Um, there was like this sweet old woman and I, it was just me, myself and I with my gym bag. That's all I had. And I was like, ma'am, please, I, I need to get to this flight. I need to get to this flight. Can I please just skip you? And she's like, oh yeah, yeah. Just please. You're fine. So nobody in line made like a snarky comment, like nothing like that. Thank gosh, because that would have set me off. But I'm showing this woman my passport. Here's all my IDs. Here's my rapid test. Here's my COVID card. And she takes my COVID card and she goes, well, this is all you needed. And I was like, ma'am, uh, ma'am, no, because that other guy put his hand in my face. He was very disrespectful. He threw my military ID at me. Like I, I just, she heard the hurt in my voice. And she goes, I'm like, she was very apologetic about him, but then also told me to report him. So I think she knew exactly who I was talking about. Mm -hmm. So I make it through security and then I get to my gate and I made it there. Like, yes, I have made it. No, we're good. Nothing's delayed. And there's that man at my gate. He was the gay person. Mm -hmm. I was like, wow, this greatest day ever. So I walk <laughs> up to him and I take out my phone. I pull out my camera and he's like, what are you doing? I was like, just hold still. And I took a picture of his badge because <laughs> I did not want to be wrong when I reported him. Yeah. Because 
Um, again, like for me, uh, when he put his hand, like he already disrespected me, but when he put his hand in my face to try to silence me as somebody that has been through domestic violence and all that, like that was super triggering. Um, and that's when I knew I had like T minus four minutes to get away from this man. Mm -hmm. Um, so I killed him. Yes. Yes. Because (laughs) all red was just going across me. Um, I, you know, it's no secret. Like I post about like many, this many that like, I love men. I do, but because of my past traumas with men, I, if you know, you know, I don't like you. (laughs) So, um, him doing that was just like, this is why I say things like this. Um, so I get on the flight, I'm headed to Atlanta. We're paused on the runway. And I'm like, what, what, what are we doing? What are we doing? Why are we not going? And there was too much congestion. So we had to wait and I was on the runway for an hour and I knew I wasn't going to make my next flight. I knew it. I was going to miss the connecting and I'm texting the group chat. I'm letting Mike know I'm I'm not going to make it. I'm already finding another flight. And that's from Atlanta. From Atlanta. Yeah. So I'm calling my family and letting them know they were already setting me up at a nice hotel, like a very nice hotel. (laughs) Um, So I get to Atlanta. I had already accepted that I wasn't making the flight and the flight was already gone. Mm -hmm. So all I was thinking about was getting to that hotel, relaxing, getting a meal, an actual meal, because I was surviving on a protein bar. Yeah. Wow. Um, so, and those women were so nice. They gave me shrimp and grits. See, everything's better in the South. Yeah. I <laughs> like Never fly North again. Rude. Um, I get good food. Um, so I did have a good experience while laid over in Atlanta. Now, the very next day, um, it was a straight flight from Atlanta to Johannesburg. I had Chad Wesley Smith with me. I had um, Jonathan Garcia. Yeah, Marisa, had, right? Yeah, Marisa and yeah. they yeah. were all with me. So I'm yeah. like, cool, you know what? If I miss it, so do they. And at this point, like I'm a, I have, I'm gonna get there one day out. This is yeah. it. I need to make, if this flight didn't go well, I wasn't That's making it. it to South Africa. Yeah. But sure enough, this flight also got delayed, but it was a one way, right? It was direct flight. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't too concerned. I I knew like the chances of it gone, but they had overbooked it. They had overbooked it because they didn't like, they didn't essentially see themselves having all these cancellations and reconnections. So it was like overbooked by like, I want to say like 30 people. So 30 people need to get their big ASS off that thing. Cause I'm going to be real honest with you. I ain't what's causing this, this air flight, this flight to be overweight right now. Yeah, I'm not, yeah. it's not me. <laughs> it is not me. And then there was like this church group that had at least 45 people. And I'm sitting here like, you know what, you know what the godly thing to do you guys, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> like yeah. you, you are stalling us. Just raise your hand, leave the next day. They had a flight ready for you. Um, And they were actually given like money, like not vouchers, but money for you to get off. I was remembering that. Wasn't the price going up and up? And you were like, maybe I'm going to take this thousand dollars or whatever. Well, it was right at 3000. And I said, if it reaches 3000, I might just take this money and run. Yeah. But it never did. (laughs) <laughs> right. Okay, yeah, because yeah. I'm like, well, if I go to South Africa and I place this, well, I kind of even it out anyways, mm-hmm. but I still wanted that South African experience. I wasn't just going to give up. Mm-hmm. So we finally take off. Um, I switched seats with this like larger man who really needed the extra leg room. I didn't, he had two seats. I had one, but with all the leg space. So because of his two seats, I was able to curl up and go to sleep. Nice. And I woke up with a um, inflatable like balloon frog hmm. on my chair. Apparently there was like a dude that could make balloon animals. Oh, okay. And he just thought like I was so precious and put like an inflatable frog on my chair. I was like, 
this is probably a tracking device. I'm going to pop this. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Like as soon as I got out of the airport with that frog, I was like, Seek, and I threw it away. That um, is so funny. You're so, I, cause I remember <laughs> messaging with you leading into this and stuff. And you're like very paranoid about international travel. Like people know your whereabouts. You're like Jason Bourne, you know, it's like, yeah. no, I mean, anything... I have a trap phone, everything. You will not, yeah. there's not going to be anything that's going to tie me to my locations. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, uh, we, I would, I don't know how I missed this somewhere in the information. I missed this. So we're, it's us, Chelsea Savitt, like Kimberly Walford, like we're all in this van where it's like 12 in the morning there, mm -hmm. 12 in the morning there. So it, we're just all sitting there like, God, this is starting to take a long time. Mm -hmm. Like, and I think it was Jonathan that pulled up his ways and put in the hotel information. It was like two hours on that bus, mm -hmm. two hours on a very cramped space. Yeah. And here I am. I'm like, oh no, I could feel like the sickness coming. I was like, I don't want to ruin anybody's. Oh. I know everybody just wants to get to their hotel. And here I am like just preventing my body from getting sick. And it wasn't like everybody was staying at the same hotel. So we stopped here. We stopped there. Then, of course, my last hotel was the last drop off. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I get to my room. I get sick. I tried running a bath for my legs because I didn't get up that entire flight because mm -hmm. um, I focused on sleeping. <laughs> so my legs were super swollen and I started a bath and I remember turning it off to get like my Epsom salt and stuff to relax. And I fell asleep. I oh. fell asleep in the bed. So I didn't take a bath. And again, this is like two 30 in the morning, South African time. So at this point I've been up for a solid 24, mm. um, while traveling for a solid 24, I woke up the next day and I felt pretty okay. Again, I'm like at this point, half a day out from competing. Okay. And, uh, yeah. That was the thing. So when you woke up that next day, were you competing? later that day or the very the next day, the very following day. Okay. So I woke up. Yeah. I woke up and, um, you know, we were very early weigh-ins. Mm -hmm. So that meant like, okay. And you go to bed early, mm -hmm. but I'm stuck on North Carolina time. So that might not be the best. And I remember like, I got ready. I walked in the bathroom. I was like, why is there bath water? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> I drained it, but I went down and had breakfast because I'm like, I need to refuel. I need to refuel as much as I can. Um, and the breakfast was amazing. I mean, they even had like omelet, um, grills to where mm -hmm. they would make your own omelet, have whatever you wanted in it, they would have it. It looked like the yeah. restaurant scene there was kind of good in the hotels and stuff, just from everything I saw on social media. Yeah. Like I didn't have monkeys. Um, which is, <laughs> I'm kind of glad about, but I'm also with my love for animals. I'm kind of upset about because I, the, the person in me is like, I could have befriended them. Like we, we wouldn't have stole your, they wouldn't have stole your pre-workout. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I did that and I was like messaging Delaney and I was like, Hey, what room are you in? He's like, I'm actually on the balcony. I was like, you have a balcony. I have a balcony. And I walked out and he was like, Literally, it was my room, Mike's room, and Delaney's room. Like, we were all sharing the same balcony. So we went, we checked out the venue um, just to see how to, like, kind of get there. And, you know, he he had to do his weigh-ins to make sure, like, he was on target. So he wanted to check with the competition scale. I knew I was fine. It didn't, like, nothing well, faced me at this point. You always are, right? I mean, yeah. weight, cutting, weight cutting is never a thing really for you, is it? You're always eating no. out to meats, right? No. And um, which was bizarre because like TMI from all the airport food I was eating, I was pretty constipated. <laughs> like traveling too. Traveling weight does that. Added on there was from not being able to go to the bathroom because mm -hmm. I was not drinking as much water as I normally would. I was just trying to survive. Um so yeah, I get back to the room after all that and I slept some more. And I remember I had a phone call with my mom and this is one thing like I actually spoke about the other day. Like if people see me on my phone during a competition, mind your business. <laughs> I am talking to my mom 
And that's not going to change. Like my mom has um, neurological issues. So she doesn't quite remember things like her short-term memory is gone. So she knew I wasn't at home because she's at my house, but she doesn't know where I'm at and why I haven't called her. So like the whole time I was like video chatting her, I was showing her like South Africa was beautiful. Like the part I was in was very beautiful. Sun City, 10 out of 10. Um, so it, I mean, it kind of looked like a scene out of the Lion King when the sun was rising, it was very beautiful experience. So it's unfortunate. I didn't get to spend as much time there. Um, but yeah, like I go to sleep and I wake up knowing that I had to get ready to go to this competition, get ready for weigh-ins. I did eat before (laughs) weigh-ins because I was just so hungry and, um, yeah, like weigh-ins went fine. And I, it just something like something just felt off and I went to put my knee sleeves on and I'm like, Mike, I need help putting my knee sleeves on. They just weren't getting on. And I'm like, what, what is the problem? And it wasn't until we were about to start that I realized that my legs were still so swollen from the flight that the knee sleeves were cutting off my circulation. So I had no feeling in my legs (laughs) going, going into squats. So that was wild. And that's not like, like you're, you're a seasoned veteran of the sport. So it's like this, it just goes to show that like, even with all the preparation and everything, like, you never know, you never know what can possibly happen with these travel experiences. Yeah. And so, um, I realized that my legs were still swollen from the flights. Cause again, like my body didn't get that time to fully recover like it needed. Um, so my legs were swollen, my feet were tingling the whole time. So it's kind of like they're asleep because they're just so numb. So trying to walk out a squat was terrifying because I'm like, um, is my foot on the ground? (laughs) Yeah. You can't feel your feet. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And even walking out to my second attempt, I was looking at my feet and actually tripped because I didn't know where the floor, like if I was touching the floor or not. Um, so squats. They went okay, but I think the, you know, the third one was like a real indication, like something's really wrong. Something is like, I got scared during my third one because when I walked out, um, and here's the thing when it comes back to like, you know, you said you're like Jason Bourne. I know every, I knew every exit entrance, everything to that venue. I had looked it up prior to even getting there because if something goes wrong, I'm out. Like Mm -hmm. y'all might not know where you're going, but I definitely know where I'm going. And that is PTSD. That is PTSD to the full max. So when I was walking out my third attempt squat, like I was focused on, of course, not falling, but then there was like this wind tunnel noise and it may not even like nobody else heard it, but me. And so like a brief second, like I stood there and these men weren't understanding what I was saying. Cause I was saying, what was that noise? Well, cause if I can put a picture to it, I'm fine. But because I didn't know what was going on, I just wanted to re-rack and go check it out real quick mm-hmm. because like now my heart's racing too bad. My adrenaline's too high. And typically I know if my adrenaline's too high going into any lift, it's not going to go well. And I missed it. But the first thing I did was when I walked off, I said to Mike, I was like, did you hear that noise? Like I almost made myself sound crazy, but I knew if I re-racked and went to check out what the noise was, it would have caused a few red flags. And I knew that the circumstances probably wouldn't have been in my favor and they would have had me like talking to medical or something. Yeah. Um, And I didn't want that. That's like, I knew it was live streamed and, you know, social media, right? Yeah. Look for moments like this. And that was like, I'm trying to calm myself down, but I'm also telling myself, if you do this, this is what's going to happen. And so like, I just did what I could and just immediately got off. I got off and I was like, well, what was that noise? And even when I went to the bathroom directly after squats, I was looking for that noise, never found it. So a part of me was like, well, was it there? Or did my tubes just have like this I don't know. Yeah. That's freaky. When you hear, start hearing things and stuff, it, it gets in your head right, real quick. Yeah. 
So um, I, I mean, especially I call with the leg mom. problems yeah. and stuff, you're kind of like, there's multiple things are going wrong here. Yeah. And so like I called my mom and she just, again, I had to tell her I was in South Africa. <laughs> it's like repetitive conversations before we can actually get to the point while I was calling. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I just, I went back there to bench and there is a big freaking baboon right there at the window. And I'm like, okay, my day is getting better. It's <laughs> nice. You saw that <laughs> as a like, positive. Yeah. Like Mike and they were like, Heather, get over here. I was like, I just need to get a picture and bench like three for three went well. I got one, played it pretty conservative. Um, and then deadlift came around and missed my opener. Um, and I know why I missed my opener. Like my foot slid, the carpet was kind of like had baby powder on it. So I slid on that and it annoyed me to no end. It was 185, right? This 185 is not even things that I pause in competition. Yeah. But it is what it is. Came out there, got it on the next one. And then, you know, this is where the realization comes in. My body has been through a lot to get here. And it's not as strong as it probably should be. Yeah. And so, I mean, we only bumped it five kilos and I missed 190. So one for three on squash was just not like, that's very rare for me. Yeah. It, uh, it says on open power thing that you went from 185 to 193. So it looks like you were oh. trying to, pull oh, we were trying to break a world record then. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, we yeah, were all secured second anyways. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was, it was one of those situations to where if I get it cool, if not also cool, like it doesn't matter. I mean, just, you know, hearing this story, like, I hope that people can, can see like, even Heather Connor on like po- pretty much the worst possible day ever, you're still putting up a 524 dots um, yeah. and still totaling like just barely under 400 kilos. Um, so I think the that's worst amazing. Thing, that's amazing. Yeah. Like, and I congratulate it Tiff. Like yeah. her and I are very active on speaking to each other on social media. So, you know, it wasn't like I was a sore loser. Like I'm proud of her. You know, mm-hmm. she's younger. She has so much more in this sport to give, right? I'm about to be 32. <laughs> so, and I actually told this to uh, Jessica the other day, the other 47. Mm-hmm. I told her, I said, listen, you guys are in two different, you know, where I'm at in life is a lot different than where you are. Exactly. We're at different stages. Mm-hmm. I'm getting to the point where I want a family. Mm -hmm. And that will be my priority. Mm -hmm. You guys are young. You're, you're in school or you're finishing school. Like you are in your prime time to be doing this. Like it is what it is. What I can do as like a experienced lifter in the sport is to encourage you, you know, like I told Tiff when she had failed to get that world record total, over and over and over again I told her like you're gonna get it you're going to get it like I know it um and I think and a lot of people are like you're just mad it's again social media you're just mad and I'm like no no I'm not I'm mad at the situation I'm mad that I tried my best to get here when I was supposed to and unfortunately I could not I'm mad because there was this whole big picture of how it was supposed to go out and it didn't. Like, I feel like I felt myself, I felt powerlifting America, I, you know, whoever, like it was that. Well, the fans of the sport, I mean, like, like myself, like <laughs> yeah. everyone just really wanted to see this, like the clash of the yeah. Titans, like, like this was exactly. one of the best. Uh, gonna be one of the most epic battles in all of worlds um, and I wanted it and yeah. I wanted it so when it didn't happen it was like well I mean the good news is I made it here yeah. <laughs> um and t- I remember this one total. DM this one DM was like you're just making excuses like people from Canada had to travel I was like this is why I can't respond to people because this is somebody that doesn't know what's happened exactly it's not that people from New Zealand or Canada had to travel 24 hours. It took me four and a half days to get here. My, yeah, <laughs> not exactly. a day, four and a half of living on airport food. Um, and it's, it does take that toll on your body. 
So when it came time for me to do like girl power in France, oh, I told them immediately, we're, get, we're doing a direct flight to France. I don't care what you got to do. I don't care if I got to cover the charges. It's going to be direct mm -hmm, mm -hmm. no matter what. And sure enough, they made it work. I got there five days early and all of a sudden like, okay, my numbers are going back up a little bit, but yeah. what people don't understand like right, right after South Africa, right after I competed, I had to leave the very next day. I yeah. wasn't in South Africa for not even two days because I had to leave to come back to try to prepare for world games, which I ultimately had to pull out due to health reasons. And those are health reasons that involve like my heart. And of course, like at this point, I only had one tube in my ear, I had to get the other. Um, so that was causing some balance issues. And the doctor's concerns were one, my heart. So there was like no volume at all. And then two, if I have weight on my back and there's an, a balance issue, it puts me at risk and it puts everybody else at risk as well. Yeah. So that's like something I had to come to terms with and say, you know what, this, this isn't the time. And I gave it to like the very, as far as I could before I said, I, I just cannot, I can't do it. And yeah, of course, I, I had people mad at me for that. Like, <laughs> yeah, I remember. Um, I mean, that's the thing is like people, if they don't, if all they see is, you know, the live stream and they see yeah. like Heather didn't put up a very great performance by her standards. And especially when everyone's expecting that there's going to be this huge battle and your prep was going amazing. Tips prep was going amazing. Um, so, you know, we, everyone had these super high expectations. And then yeah. of course they kind of like are going to vent towards you like, Oh, I didn't get to watch the show that I wanted to watch. Um, and that yeah. is unfortunate, but you, yeah. you take such a positive, like you said, encouraging uh tiff and being yeah. a role model for the other women in the sport like I, I know i hear on the king of the lifts podcast that there's women in korea and japan and stuff that look up to you as being as being like the role model in the sport yeah. how to be like a strong independent woman and so you know the people that know we love you and, and you can do no wrong but um but tell us like at, right after south africa your training was on point leading into it but then with the the ear uh, issue that you had in South Africa, you, you got checked out and stuff afterwards yeah. and you found this heart problem. And so, so your training was a little bad. Your training and, was a little this derailed, is, right? So this is what people don't understand because they're like, oh, just go to the doctor. Mm -hmm. hmm. Okay. And this is where like, if you know, you know, really kicks in. I have TRICARE, right? That's military medicine. Okay. And everything started back in June of 2021. So right after Daytona USAPL nationals, I was like, I had gotten back and immediately went to the hospital because I was trying to walk to my kitchen and passed out. Wow. And my family found me and they're like, no, like you're going. And I got taken in and my kidneys were failing. Like no matter how much water I drank, it wasn't flushing properly. Um, and so they had to put me on like, all these antibiotics. And at this point, that's all they were looking at because that was the biggest red flag. And I remember like I had, allergic, <laughs> I had an allergic reaction to these antibiotics. So I had to end up staying overnight. And the very next day when I got out, I had a podcast with King of the Lips <laughs> mm -hmm. and my face, my lips, everything was so swollen. I was like, can we just make sure this is audio? <laughs> yeah, audio, <laughs> because audio. It, I look like, um, what is that hunchback of Notre Dame? That's what I look like. I was just so swollen and Ryan was very kind. He was like, Heather, do you want to reschedule? I'm like, no, I'm here. I'm here. And my esophagus was swelling, um, to the point where I could only have liquids. So, <laughs> and this is after totaling 408, I had unofficially broken the longest standing world record total ever. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm on a high and then I'm boom, I'm on this low. So from June all the way, I got seen in February again. And that's the thing with TRICARE. You can call and say, I need an appointment, but your appointment won't be until like six to eight months out. Yeah. And so you're doing the best that you can. Um, at this point, like my whole body is hurting my whole body. And like, I mean, my chest, like everything, they gave me like this, uh, anti-inflammatory, like topical cream that I had to take breaks while I was teaching to go put this on to try to stop that pain. And it just wasn't working. 
Um, so they had to do like emergency blood tests, all that on me. Um, and the dude called and I will never forget this day. He called and had the wrong person's paperwork in his hands. He almost, he almost did a HIPAA violation. Like as soon as I realized he had asked me like this very bizarre question, I said, sir, I don't know whose paperwork you're reading, but it is not mine. Mm -hmm. It is not mine. So he then found my paperwork and he's like, well, nothing seems out of the ordinary. Well, okay. I'm going to go, go ahead and pull these up on my phone. And when I pull the results up on my phone, my lab results, everything was like, hi, hi, hi. And I'm like, what, like, what do you mean? Um, so I had like four cysts on my breast. Um, I had ovarian cysts, like everything was just not like they had to be removed like immediately. And, um, so, okay, we're in February, nothing happens again till June when I'm at a restaurant and I have an allergic reaction. Mind you, I had no allergies at this point to food, wow. to food. Wow. and all of a sudden, like my whole body's breaking out in hives. My esophagus is swelling. We had, I was not in the state. So we had to run, um, out of state to a hospital to make sure that I was going to be okay. And I didn't get tested for all that. So it's June. I didn't get tested for that till late September. Wow. And that's when they found out I was allergic to beef and allergic to tree nuts. And they still are trying to find out what other things I'm allergic to because it's still happening. Like there's mold on trees. So if it's really windy, I got to wear a mask or my esophagus will fall to the point where I can't breathe. Wow. So even while we were going to South Africa, I was like, Hey, um, so we do have like medics there, right? Mm -hmm. We do have medics in case something happened. Um, because at this point I still didn't know what was going on. And so this was a whole year of being like beat around the bush. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, I get in when I can, and it's not as easy as saying like, Hey, you guys, I need to reschedule this appointment. Cause that rescheduling could mean I'll be seen in nine months. They oh, just yeah. do not have the supporting staff for that. I have to get it approved to see a specialist. So now like all my stuff has been transferred to UNC Chapel Hill, um, where UNC medical takes care of me and they do an, a phenomenal job, okay. but it's, that was, that was a year I had to get that. Wow. And you were dealing with all of that while, you know, qualifying for worlds, training for worlds, prepping <laughs> yeah. all of this. And then still doing really good. I mean, like, like at your numbers were going really, really great leading into yeah. all of that. And then, yeah. so after South Africa, um, what happened with your health and everything between that and when you went to girl power? So before I went to girl power, I actually had, I was in the hospital about a week prior okay. and I had to get approved to even go there. Um, because they were wondering, like, we have to make sure that this medication is working for you. Here are three EpiPens because I only get one hit out of them. Right. And so they're making sure that, okay, here's a medical facility. They do accept TRICARE here. If you have any, like I had to have all that set up. Um, and again, like, I'm just hoping I can get there five days early. I, I did. Um, but the whole time, like I'm having to take like three different pills, drink plenty of water and just do my best to rest and all this stuff. Like I am going to like, put it out there. You can find it on globe Juro. So if you're taking any kind of medications, look it up because you don't even know if it's like, you're allowed to take that in competition. So before I even get it, I'm looking it up because I have it on my phone, what I'm being prescribed. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's only one that I thought I would have to fill out a TUE for, but it isn't prohibited in competition. So we were good. Okay. Um, and that's just the medication for my esophagus. But I mean, I have to carry like my medical bags with me and they can't leave my site, like nothing like that. And so I get to this foreign country. Um, I did have people with me this time. Yeah. I had my gym owners who are like a second mom and dad to me. And I had um, a really close, who I would say like a relative of us <laughs> with us. And they made sure the entire time I was okay. 
I had Colin going out there. Um, you know, he wasn't going to get there till probably the day before. Um, but because again, I know how traveling goes for me. I told essentially my family, go explore these cities, go do what you want. Cause I'm going to be in my room. I, I didn't want to be around people. While I was getting sick, mm-hmm. which, you know, they understood. And then I went out. Um, and then I went out by myself to the cathedrals. Like I wanted to see like the churches, um, because it was almost St. Teresa's day and being like a Catholic, like I wanted to go pay my respects. And St. Teresa's day was actually the day of the competition, um, which I'm a firm believer that, you know, praying to her and being there, like that helped me a lot, um, probably mentally, but, um, after South Africa, I got with Kedrick, who is actually, um, Taylor Atwood's nutritionist. Yeah. He started doing my nutrition because when I got on all these medications, I was dropping weight, like nothing. Mm -hmm. And at at that point I couldn't, I didn't know what to do. So I hired him. He was very intelligent and he got me to my highest walking weight in a while, which was like 47.5. Okay. And he made sure like, okay, this is what I want you to do. Make sure you're doing this. And sure enough, like we weighed in like 46.8, something like that. Yeah. uh, 46.7. Yeah. And I saw like Kedrick, um, Meg Scanlon talked about having hiring him too. Yeah. Um, Like, cause you're both like people who are like, don't really have to cut and are generally very healthy, but it's like, you can take it to the next level where you're fueling your body for performance, uh, you know, better than, than you would do if you were just doing it on your own. And it seems to be making a really big difference. So I hope you're still with him. You're still with him. You're going to keep using him. Okay, good. I actually met him in South Africa. We were doing like this case study. And when he came to my room to ask me some questions, i bombarded him with like a bunch of questions because I got a lot of questions and I want answers to them. So I hope like you're a person that can give me answers or I'm going to figure it out on my own. And a lot of people think I'm like questioning their intelligence. I'm not. I just like to learn. And I think that's the teacher in me. So I like preface that before I like ask them all these questions, but him and I have like a great coach athlete relationship. He is amazing. Um, I try to support reformance who he is with reformance training as much as I can by reposting some of their um, posts, like in my stories, because a lot of their stuff is very informative. Yeah. Very informative very informative like they had they were one of the first ones that had like one of the really nice uh infographic things on the new bench rules and stuff like this like yeah Kedrick and the whole reformance team seems to be really doing great yeah they're good people too so I like to be with good people and I like to support good people of course because there's a lot of mean people in this sport there's a lot of mean coaches there's a lot of mean athletes and honestly, like I have nothing to do with these people. So like, even in the gym, like when people know that I know all these people, they're like, so how is so-and-so in person? I'm like, trash, trash. (laughs) You're out of 10 recommend like immediately. Like I ain't got to lie to you. I'm sure somebody could be like, Heather, she's kind of weird. All right. I tell you I'm weird. You know who I am on social media is who I am in person. Don't come up to me, hugging me unless I initiate it, or you might get elbowed in the face. I don't like being, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> don't be goofy. Um, no, you are who you show yourself I, yeah, to like, on, on social media. I love, I that. make it very clear about my mental health issues and I make my boundaries very clear. So if you're bold enough to kind of overstep them, well, there's going to be repercussions to that and yeah. don't sit here and cry about because <laughs> I'm sure. nice. I'm nice, but I don't like being disrespected. Oh, like, yeah, no. like who does, right? Exactly. Exactly. And I think the thing is, 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 uh, you're nice, but also you're strong and you're independent. So like, you're not going to take shit from anyone, you know? And And, and, you know, I don't, and it's usually like, I think because some people on social media, they just do the simple block and delete kind of thing. Mm -hmm. No, you know what? Cause they're going to get another account and they're going to keep doing it. Mm -hmm. That's what trolls do. So like, if you come at me, I'm probably going to say something way worse, way worse. And then you're going to leave me alone. Yeah. And that's typically what happens. I don't get bothered. I don't get weird DMS. Like, I don't remember the last time I got a very odd DM. And (laughs) cause I mean, that's like one of the frequently asked questions, like what kind of DMS do you, I don't, I do not. I've made it. I've made one statement very clear. Like if you are a dude 
and you send me an inappropriate photo, well, everybody going to see the inappropriate photo. Mm-hmm. You know, if I got to see, y'all got to see it. And now you're embarrassed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so... No, I mean, I think that's really awesome. And I think that's why people really look up to you. And like you were saying too, like when you're comparing with, with Tiff and Jess, like you, you're at a different stage in your life, like where you've dealt with all this shit in your life in the past. Mm -hmm. And now you have these defense mechanisms, you've built up this like, you know, muscle memory of like how to deal with these assholes and stuff like this. Well, these girls are young. They're young. And honestly, they're naive. I had an hour, almost two hour phone call with Jess the other day. Mm -hmm. you know, and she was opening up to me about some things. And I told her, I was like, well, Jess, what it comes down to you, you just can't be talking to anybody. Mm -hmm. I said, because some people that you talk to are not your friends. Yep. They talk to you simply just to get information from you to use it against you. Exactly. Because they, they want you to look bad. Like you're new, you're very new into the sport. You're definitely new into the IPF. You just need to be careful. And I let her know some things that I've dealt with in my years of experience. I said, you know, this gain to fame, like it happened like overnight for me. Like it was very fast. And Kimberly Walford was actually the person that told me the more following you get, the worse they can get. Mm -hmm. So I had to tell Jess, like your following will go up, but you got to understand some of those followers aren't there to support you. Nope. Nope. They're there there to to watch. Yeah. They're there to watch. They're there to hate. I was like, so you just, you don't need to be open and nice to everybody. You just need to sit back and kind of figure it out. Yeah. And she just, cause I mean, she had a lot of questions again, like she's, she's naive. Mm-hmm. She expects everybody to be cool. Ain't everybody cool. Yeah, That's why I'm going to be talking to everybody. <laughs> I mean, you get the vibe, like when you go to a powerlifting meet, I think in general powerlifting, you know, it's very community, like, especially local meets, you know, like you said, your first meet that you went yeah. to and stuff, everyone's trying to help you. And you kind of think okay, that's how everyone is in the sport. But it isn't when you start getting to this elite level like yeah. that you and Jess are at and stuff, you're going to start to see people have some different motives behind their behavior. So I think the careful. funniest part was when Russell or he, I guess, posted like a, um, like an interview with some athlete, an older man. And a bowler, I think, yeah, when he was like, you know, I did the best I could and all you could do was watch. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> like, like you're sitting here, like you really judging me right now. And you've never even been in my shoes. Yeah. <laughs> That's tough. Um, and that really spoke to me. So like Russ or he, he's one of those people I will always speak very highly of, right. Benika I speak very highly of her, but there are just some people I just refuse to say anything about mm-hmm. because I just, I, it's like Bambi taught us a long time ago. I'm like really showing my age right now. If you don't have nothing nice to say, exactly. don't say it at all. Exactly. Like, Especially not publicly on a podcast or something like that. You yeah. Know, but, like I'll um, never name drop. I'll never say who I'm speaking about because yeah. for me, people are going to realize it on their own. Mm-hmm. Right. If they, and it's unfortunate because you do see these social media personas and you get so excited to meet them. And then when you do meet them in person, it's like, this person's terrible. <laughs> I've experienced that myself as being someone I would consider one of the biggest yeah. fans of the sport, you know? Um, and that's why it was so refreshing when I met you in Austin last year, because you were just such a real person and so nice, but also, like you said, you have your boundaries and like you, you're just a, exactly how you present yourself on social media. So. Well, I'll tell you this, refreshing. you are, you know, whoever's doing weigh-ins, I got to respect their boundaries and get my toes done because the way they looking right now, I'm expecting a lot of people. <laughs> I said that at the gym this morning. I said, y'all, these dogs, they, they ain't looking so hot. Oh, they, well, you got like, I mean, days. my, my freaking fingernails coming off. That was, yeah. I couldn't even pull up my knee sleeve right today. I was like, look at this. Like I am so lame. Um, but I try to plan everything out like right before I leave. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm looking kind of rugged right now. It's like, you know, I got my girlies coming with me to Texas. Okay. So, I mean, and for Texas, we got a direct flight. (laughs) Okay, great. We we ain't risking it. I don't trust United States airlines. I don't trust foreign airlines. Now I will say Air France on the way back from South Africa, people were still trying to put their luggage in the overhead bins. And Air France was like, 
y'all better sit down because we taking off right now. <laughs> That's more your style. You like yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah. You know, you got to break check some people sometimes like, you know, like, mm -hmm. um, make sure that the passenger is awake, but, uh, yeah, the air France just, they took off. They were like, no, we're not waiting for you. Y'all are slow. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's good. I mean, some airlines, they need to do that. But, um, so before we go into, uh, this upcoming nationals, as yeah. I want to get like some of your info of, you know, like, like how you're going to do and everything, but girl power, tell us a little bit, like just f looking on social media, it looked like you were having a really good time in France. <laughs> Like, I it did. Was, it was very Emily in Paris, like uh, <laughs> vibes, like you're taking pictures in these cute little alleyways and like coffee shops and stuff. That cute little like, alleyway had a big ass rat. <laughs> it looked like, that cute. was like the size of a cat. It looked cute though. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it was. I had a fun time. I was surrounded by good people and the people that were competing were people that they chose from different countries as well. Um, and some of these women are in higher weight classes. So they are people I actually never really got to meet before. And I mean, all around nothing negative to say about any said person I competed against. Okay. Um, you know, I was able to officially meet Panna uh -huh. and who is Tiff's coach and he, you know, he had a rough year. Right. He had a rough year and girl power was actually on his birthday or his birthday had just passed. So, you know, like I had to hype him up. He was wearing some cargo pants. So he was really bringing it back. Like, I didn't even know those were a thing, but in France, cargo pants, you're in style. Okay. Um, but the craziest thing was like, I go to weigh-ins and I guess one of the competitors, like her boyfriend does YouTube and he already had it ready. I was like, oh, shoot. Like, you know, I had my jumpsuit on, I was looking fine. And he was like, Heather, did you know that 50 cent is in Bordeaux? I'm like, see, this guy thinks 50 cent is still relevant in America, <laughs> but you know what? I went along with it. Like I was you like, Curtis Jackson. Yeah. I was like, go shot. Eh? It's, yeah. You know, I was yeah. having a fun time with it, but I'm glad that they tied 50 cent to me. Um, um, that, <laughs> but I, I said the same. Yeah. Yeah. Like we're cool. We're tight. But I said the same thing in this podcast that I said to Jess, that I said to that dude on YouTube, I said, people are going to watch me just so they can hate on me. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I did again, I think I was, because I was surrounded by such good people. I had essentially my family there with me. Um, you know, it's a, it's a different mentality when you have somebody so close. Cause I was so used to traveling by myself and the hardest part now of, you know, competing is my mom, right? Um, because she, she got those neurological issues right before COVID happened. And prior to that, like I would call her before every competition, she'd be my last phone call before warmups. And she would be my first call after I got that platform, no matter what the, like she was just always proud. And that essentially was like ripped from me, right? Damn. So it's, I can call my mom, but my mom's like, so when are you leaving for France? And I'm like, oh girl, I'm here. I'm in, like, yeah. <laughs> I'm in France. And that's like, no matter what I'm doing, like I could call her right now. And she would ask something that like, is something that's been repetitive all week. Mm -hmm. um, so it's when she's having an off day, when I call her, it makes it very hard because you had somebody that was just, you're going to do so great. I'm so proud of you. Like no matter what, you no longer get it yeah. because they can't remember that you're even there. Mm -hmm. So it's, I'm having to relive moments, relive moments. Um, thankfully I didn't have a lot of service in that building. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, um, I called her beforehand. I said, I will keep in touch when I can or I'll call you when I get back to the hotel room. Um, but it was, it was good. Um, I was the lightest competitor there. Mm -hmm. um, I think the second was like a, a 52 May. I think she was competing as a 57. I'm not too sure on that, but she warmed up with me. She was super sweet. And I just felt very confident going in there. Um, <laughs> squats. I got called on my second squat. And I didn't necessarily know why, because I'm like, 
I know that was good. Mm-hmm. So what happened? And the lady said to me, um, she said, well, the bar's crooked on your back. And I'm like, that's not a rule. That's not a rule. Mm-hmm. But what are you looking at? You're looking at the wrong thing here. Yeah. So I said, yeah, um, I, I have scoliosis and these people don't really know English too well. Mm-hmm. Um, so they're just understanding kind of what I'm saying. Okay. Right. And I mean, that's something I got to accept. I'm in the, I'm in their country. I'm not going to, yeah. it's another one of these big things when you travel yeah. and you do competitions. Like, uh, I was at NAPF and one time, one of the technical, uh, the, the technical controller was just only spoke Spanish. And yeah. so for the team USA that was there, like a lot of the people don't speak Spanish. They don't know what he was saying. You just, you try to make yourself as understanding as possible. Like, I'm not going to yeah. get mad at this woman for not understanding my language. I am it's- her country. Yeah. It's part of the being in an international sport. You're going to have to deal with stuff like this. And obviously she's a little bit older. So it's, you know, it's not like Leah who went to school and could learn English. Like they didn't, they didn't do that. Mm -hmm. Um, So I accepted it. I said, okay, well, the bars is going to be crooked. Like Mm -hmm. that is what it is. So on that third one, Oh my God, Paul, like I squatted so deep, like my rib, because I have a short torso because of my scoliosis my rib can like hit my hip bone. And I was like, that was not fun. That was not fun. But they gave me the, well, I got the squat, but that lady still called me on depth. And I'm like, but she was calling because of the bar on my back. That's very and I'm interesting. like, see, this is, this is insane to me. And I knew if I said anything online about it, people would be like, oh, she's making an excuse, but all I'm saying is when Euros came around and a lot of people bombed out or they were getting caught on depth, I'm like, yeah, it's you that see what was I mean, there. you know, like, mm-hmm. um, again, it's one of those situations like, well, y'all will just have to see for yourself because if I, there's no way I could have possibly went any deeper without like my ribs going right through my hip. Yeah. Um, I mean. I don't like people thinking like, oh, you're making an excuse or something. You're giving us insights. You're giving us insights as a a world champion competitor. You're just giving us insights. You're not saying this is good or bad or otherwise. You're just saying this is what happened and be ready for these weird calls about where the bar is. And then Euros, like however long that was, like a month and a half, two months later. And it was like a big story all of a sudden. I've never seen that many people bomb out. Yeah, people have I mean, you can attention. look at the videos, right? Yeah, it was, it was, bad. that was sickening. I was very sad for those people. I really was because a lot of those people, I knew some of them personally and I, I did feel deeply for them. Um, but I mean, it is what it is. I ain't going to argue with this lady. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to go about my day. Bench went three for three, uh, hit 165. That was great. Um, and then deadlifts, like, it's kind of one of those things where I had been training heavy, like pushing it in competition and 190 flew. Right. Mm-hmm. And yeah, we settled that. with 195. And a part of me was like, well, do you think we should, we were backstage. And I was like, well, do you think we should go higher? Because I never do just five kilo jumps. Mm-hmm. Like I always do seven and a half plus and 195 broke the ground so fast that it got me so off balance. Mm -hmm. Like my feet didn't slide. I just wobbled. And I was like, you know what? I'm not going to try to correct this because I'm going to get hurt. Mm -hmm. So I just like, let it pull me forward and just a little cartwheel off the bar. Yeah. (laughs) Um, And then I told myself like, like if we had just did 197 and a half or even 200, I know it would have given it would have had more patience off the ground because it would have been harder to break mm-hmm. and i i would have done i know i would have got the i know i would have got it. so that was something like i was still laughing about it but it was coming it was kind of the realization and the kind of same thing i'm taking into nationals again like everything's a learning experience exactly like heather if something if your second attempt fl- flies up that hard you need to have a little bit more weight on that bar because for me i'm a very patient person with sumo And I know if it breaks, I got it, Mm -hmm. but you know, it just, I expected it to be a little harder to break that day and it just was not. 
kind of shocked me. And uh, so, you know, going forward, that's something I was like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. Is that something where you practice like in training the jumps and then the, maybe like a five kilo jump is just not enough because I know sometimes like oh, when, no. when you hit a <laughs> lift in training, you know, sometimes you get so amped up for the top single yeah. moves faster than the last one you know? Yes. And so if you're doing a, a, a suddenly a smaller jump than you normally would, mm-hmm. and it just pops off like that catches you off guard, I could totally see that happening. So, so yeah, you- like it's, you know, I go, I typically jump in training from like 170 to 182 and a half. Okay. So you see a 12.5 jump. Mm-hmm. And I tell people all the time, do not train like I do. If your body's not used to making these jumps, today is not the day to try it. Yeah. You know, and now as the weight gets heavier, it'll start to challenge me, but I'll even go 182 and a half to 192 and a half. So there's still a God, like a 10 kilo yeah. jump. Yeah. And then that's when I'm like, okay, 192 and a half, I could go to 200. I've done it. Um, or I could play it safe, but sometimes safe isn't, it's safe, but it's hit or miss if it's going to challenge me enough off the floor. Yeah. Because again, like if I'm being forced to be patient, my body is in a different position than when it flies off the ground. Yeah, exactly. Um, So, but again, learning experience, you're never to experience in the sport to learn something. That's what I absolutely love that because I mean, again, it's like, you're such a person that everyone looks up to an idol in the sport and everything. And people think, Hey, you've been doing this since 2014. You must have it all figured out. Um, and it's like, no, <laughs> we're still learning. I mean, this is still a young sport. There aren't, there isn't a manual on this. Well, um, and every person's to, different. Yeah. Like you're going to come to the, the point where your body is like, I'm not supposed to physically scientifically get past this point and you're going to hit that wall and there goes your newbie gains. And then this is where I see real strength come about because now you got to change up something Mm -hmm. to make sure that you can still progress. Right. And that's what I have to constantly do. Like it's not normal for a 103 pound female to be lifting 446 pounds. It's not normal. That's why I'm the only one doing it. Mm -hmm. So it's like, if I want to progress, what do I need to do to make sure I can break down this wall? Same with squat, same with bench. And a lot of lifters, that's when they start giving up or they'll start like switching coaches because they think switching is what's going to help them. Mm -hmm. Like, no, you just got to give yourself time. It'll come, but you got to be patient with it because it doesn't happen overnight. Like I've had to change like my grip on squats I've had to change my foot placement on deadlift. Like even with bench, I had to change things with it. But it, I mean, if you don't give yourself time to realize these changes, they're never going to come. Yeah. And just also keep putting in the work and be patient. Yeah. Like it's a, it's a really a long, it's a long person's uh, game here, you know? Um, so it's not going to be overnight with anything in powerlifting. It takes time to add muscle and build strength. Yeah. Um, Especially at right. 31. <laughs> yeah. Which you still can. I mean, it's interesting. I met someone at the gym who uh, is like super jacked and like, mm-hmm. and, and cause I only started lifting when I was 35 and yeah. uh, this guy is like 60 now. And he said he only started lifting when he was like 45 or something. And he put on a ton of muscle. I mean, he yeah. was like super. And so I'm like, okay, it's possible. So <laughs> We're getting don't, there. don't discount yourself for sure. Yeah. Um, obviously I know you, you have, you know, supreme confidence in yourself and believe in yourself. So you're going to, you're going to get there too. Um, so going from girl power, then now into power of America nationals, how are you feeling? Um, give us some sound bites. What are you going to do? <laughs> what are you going to do at power of America nationals? Well, the goal is obviously to win. Mm-hmm. Um, well, the goal first is to get a 401. Is that- I need Carpino, right? Okay, so <laughs> I yes. need my Carpino. So for people who don't know, basically the qualifying total to make it onto the U.S. national team is to hit 401 total in the 47 kilo weight class. So that's and that's a Carpino one total, but basically it's just it's a qualifying total 401. Yes. So that is first and foremost what I want to get, mm-hmm. and 
I know certain numbers will get me there. Yeah. And you don't these have to are give all us, numbers I've hit before. <laughs> yeah. You don't have to give us like your yeah. you know, exact numbers and stuff. Oh, we know you're going to go for four one. You've hit four ten yeah. before. So yeah. Um, I, I think it's going to be interesting. Um, I do know this will be the first time some people will have actual competition that would challenge them. So, um, it was said best on another podcast that I was mentioned in. They're like, you know what, if the, if my first competition was Heather Connor, I'd be terrified because, and she goes like, I don't even compete in her weight class. She goes, but she scares me because like, for me, like, like you said, I have a lot of confidence in myself Yeah. and, um, you know, I'm not going after anybody. You're coming after me. Everybody wants to be Heather Connor at this point. Exactly. Right. And if you think that I'm just going to give you something, you're crazy. That's I'm not doing nobody any favors by just saying here, here's a national championship for you. You know what? Like, um, so I think what's going to happen is I'm going to push people to their full potential, but that's what I want. That's what everybody wants. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's what we all uh, want to see. And it's going to like tell us all this time. It's going to come down to my final deadlift. Mm-hmm. I actually, I think it'll come to my second deadlift and the final will just be the seal. Right. That's how it plays out in my head. Now, again, like, I know how to get in somebody's head and either that can break you or that can piss you off to do really, really well. Yeah. Um, it's all dependent on you. Like how about those, I know uh, what I'm bangles. doing? <laughs> how about those bangles talking shit about the chiefs? And then, uh, they're calling it a uh, burrow head instead of arrowhead stadium. And they fucked around and found out, didn't they? That's right. That's <laughs> so. right. And it's, Again, like, you know, I, I know what kind of competitor I am. I know how I can get in somebody's head. Mm-hmm. And I think, and you know, I say this all the time because it's going to be me, Cindy and Jess, right? Mm-hmm. Cindy's and, actually not coming. But, oh, uh, okay. So it's going to be me and Jess, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I, we're definitely going to put on a show. We're going to give a show. Like people don't really get shows from 47s and you know, she needs to be pushed. Mm-hmm. And go, what, what's going to happen when you get to worlds? <laughs> Again, you ain't no. going to get handed a world title. Like you going against some strong little women. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's going to push her to the point where her and her coach have to decide what am I going to do? And Jason's a very smart man. Oh. I have much respect for him. He's kind. He's a great coach. And he does very well. He's very, very smart. Game day coaching, online coaching. He's a very smart man. So I trust Jason has her best interest in mind. But Jason also knows me. You know, and it's it's probably something that I think all coaches should, like, if you don't bother her, she won't get up here. Mm-hmm. It's like, yeah. I was well, like, I'm like a cat. Like, I will leave you alone, but if you pet me too many times, okay, well, now you're about to get scratched or bit or whatever. <laughs> and now I'm awake and I'm going to laugh while I'm getting in your head. And so this will, I think, test just physically and mentally. Good. You That'll know? be a good, and, and that's yeah. what you want to see. I mean, Jess, yeah. um, she's the national champion in USAPL from Megan Atz, but yeah. basically this will be the first time like really being thrown into the fire. All right. And that's what we want coming out of our nationals. You know, we want our, we want the national team when we send them out to worlds to be battle tested and ready to go. And we had this conversation on the phone. We did. She goes, so like, are they able to take two? I was like, girl, yeah. Yeah. You know, because you're, you're getting close and some people, they start second guessing everything like, oh my gosh, like, what if I don't perform well? And so the first thing I'm not going to do is like, hurt her spirits yeah I'm hyping her I'm like just listen if if I win and you play second and you meet that Carpino I'm pretty confident you're going to get an invite yep because unfortunately for higher weight classes that Carpino is pretty freaking high (laughs) 
Yeah, uh, Agatha high. and Jess uh, in the 76s, you know, pushed up the world total so high that it's, yeah, it's difficult. It's almost um, imaginable to think of somebody reaching that Carpino in certain weight classes. Mm-hmm. Um, so I try to let her know. Again, I said the first thing I wanted to do was reach the Carpino. Mm-hmm. But I do fully believe that this will be the year that 247s get invited to Worlds. I hope so. And, you know, that in itself will make for a really big story. It right? will because. Yeah, no. yeah, like it clearly get the world record, you know, bench and kind of challenge the world record total on a perfect day. Yeah. Right. And, and like I mean, said, at any she's, point, she's three young. of us. Yeah. And she's, she's making good progress. I mean, she has a great, she made really good choices in her coaching yeah. staff behind her. So she's going to get stronger and she's got a long future. That's right. And that's what yeah. I try to encourage and tell her, you know, again, we're at different phases, right? Um, and I only want her to stay motivated in the sport, Yeah. but I also need her to know that competition day come. I'm not your friend. Yeah. yeah. I'm your competitor. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to treat you as so I'm not going to be rude to you, but I'm also not going to have a friendly conversation and be focused. And I expect the same from her because she knows this isn't going to be easy. That's really respecting your competition. Right. Honestly. I mean, if you were just going to go in there and be super nice, that would kind of be disrespectful in the sense, like you don't think of her as a threat. Um, but you're going to treat her like a real competitor and, and it'll be good for her too. Like we said before, you know, to get battle tested like that. Well, yeah. And, you know, I think having her potentially go to worlds with me, um, I'm, I would be excited for her. Yeah. I, you know, I, I just, I would love to, you know, go out on her third attempt bench, just kind of like a just thing where her competitor went out watch her pull that final deadlift and I would just love to see in that moment not behind stage but right there with everybody in that crowd watch her break that world record bench you know you have three people that can battle at 347 not even 47 kilos Mm -hmm. battling out a world record total this hasn't happened in ever Mm -hmm. you know what I mean nobody was battling or challenging Wei Ling Chen like it wasn't happening Mm -hmm. um so I, I'm very confident in myself. I'm very confident in Jess, you know, she expressed some things to me and I said, well, that's okay. I said, because I'm fully, I fully believe that when the day comes, you will do just fine. And I, at any time I could have been like, yeah, this is going on with her or she's stressed because she's got exams. Yeah. No, if you're going against me, I want your best self against me. Yep. You know, like if somebody's injured, you know, that sucks. But I also know this person went against me and kind of was really close to me while they're injured. Mm -hmm. And that's scary. (laughs) Well, I think that's a world champion mentality, you know, is that you, you don't want to play against an opponent that is, you know, has one arm tied behind their back or something. It's like, you wanted their best. Yeah. Like even Cindy, yeah. Like even Cindy, like last year, like, I mean, Yes, I was going to win, but I also know that she did the best that she could. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think that's what I encouraged the younger generation while teaching. Like, if you're at least trying your best, that's all I can ask for you. Yeah. Like, don't just sit out here and go out and say, oh, I'm going against Heather Connor. I've already lost. Yeah. Like, and Cindy took that mentality and mm-hmm. put, kept putting in the hard work and she went to North Americans yeah. and she's a North American champ. And I told her, I told Cindy, because I mean, I just got invited to Worlds. I said, Cindy, look, be on the lookout for that NAPF because I just declined it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I knew she was going to get it. And, and it she was, was like, cool. oh, are you serious? I'm like, yeah, girl. Yeah. And she went and she's, and she's still training. She's still doing good. I think she just yeah. pulling out for some personal reasons that she hasn't said, but she's not going to be able to make it. Yeah. And but, she's a sweet girl. So that's unfortunate. Mm-hmm. But if there's always a reason, if somebody is yeah. pulling out, then you know, I just got to respect that and just wish them well in whatever they're doing. Yeah, for sure. So getting back to your training though, and your numbers here. So can we expect, are we going to see a 200 kilo deadlift? Are we going to see PRs? 
uh, on, because it looks like, uh, tell us how your training is going. Like, <laughs> how are you feeling right now? Like you're, I feel okay. Uh, my hip sometimes is hit or miss, but the good news is, um, I found a way to work with that hip to where that pain has subsided. Um, again, like I have Kedrick in my corner, I have a in-house massage therapist and physical therapist. So I'm constantly being proactive in that approach. Um, I definitely feel like there's a PR squat incoming. I definitely feel with how bench is going, like that's been the lift this cycle. I feel like there's definitely, um, a PR bench coming. And as far as deadlifts, I want to tell you hundred percent, there's 200. I want to pull 200, but if I can pull 195 or 197 and a half and secure a win, I sure will. (laughs) It's all strategy at that point. Yeah, because, you got to be smart. Yeah, you got to be smart. And you, like I've I've won on body weight at world competitions before. And sometimes that's just what you got to do. Like if, you know, you're not your strongest self when it comes to the final deadlifts, you got to be very strategic about it. And I also got to take into account, we're not going to start lifting till 4 p.m. Yeah, Bro, how do you feel about I, that? My bedtime starts at 7.45. Oh, you're like the one person who is actually hurt by this. Yeah. No, I mean, no, I say all that. Well, I, I mean. I was hurt by it, but I will be a grumpy old lady about it. Well, I mean, it's just <laughs> a lot of people, especially in lighter weight classes and in women's weight classes, you know, it's always this thing of like, you have to weigh in at like 7 a.m. or 6 a.m. or something crazy. Oh, yeah. And you're yeah, very like true. regimented and you get up really early and go to bed uh, really early and stuff. So it's yeah. like that works for you. Um, but for a lot of people, they want the the later. Uh, weigh somebody in. cutting I really hate that that they had that 2 p.m. Especially for the men, because you know the men are cutting. Yeah, I hate that they have that 2 p.m. Uh-huh. Right, but you know that ain't my business. Yeah. What I will say is I am a very routine person, and that is my business. Yeah. So I'll be up for a while because I get up at now on a regular work day. I get up at three. Yeah, right? I knew that. I knew three in the super- morning. Yeah. And on a off day, I'm up at 4:30. So there's a lot. Of, like I'll eat. And then I'm like, hmm, what are we going to do today? We got till like 1.30. I'm, I'm going to go get my hair done or something. Just do something. Get out of this building. Yeah. You know, again, I have good people with me. And I know, and, and you know what? I'm going to go ahead and tell you, you might want to get this on camera, like while you're there. Okay. Here, here's what you're going to see walking through a door. Okay. A blonde a redhead and a brunette. <laughs> so okay. gosh, it is. I said, Oh my gosh, we are a walking meme. Yeah. Me, and then, you know, the brunette, she's Puerto Rican and she is set on being a cowgirl that whole time we were there. <laughs> Cause it's right. <laughs> I call, yeah. I call her the Puerto Rican cowgirl coming in blonde oh. girl, super pregnant. Um, but she kind of mean, so just make sure you got some candy or something for her. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> she, uh, it's a it's a funny funny crew about to walk in and then you have of course one of our security guards that's what i dubbed that person um but that person's also very private so okay. if you see them just wait that they are not in that camera lens and then you okay. can <laughs> okay so it's kind of one of those deals but um their husbands are super proud that they are not having to deal with us. Uh, <laughs> so they're like, that is a trio. I just want to stay out of the way. Yeah. And, you know, uh, one of them is the gym owner. Her name's Amy Mason. And cool. I'm with her all the time. Every day I'm with her. Okay. She's like the second mom to me. And she is the silliest person. She's an older person and she's so innocent in some things that she says that she doesn't even know how bizarre or like almost offensive. I'm like, uh-huh. slow it down. <laughs> Listen to what you're saying. She goes, oh my God. I'm like, yeah, don't say that no more. Don't say that no more. And then the blonde Stephanie, she's like a sister. She just, she's just so happy to be there. Cool. She, she is um she's like a proud proud friend she just wanted to be there so bad um so yeah <laughs> well it's good for them they get, maybe, they, that. maybe they don't wake up at 3 a.m like you and they, they are gonna get to sleep in and do their normal routine a little bit well that's um, why we got separate rooms 
you know, I, I realized when I went to Pennsylvania for Amy, actually, she was the one that was competing. Okay. Um, I thought we had separate rooms, but her husband got us all like a shared room. And here I am in bed at four and all the lights are off. And I was like, I want to get up. I want to turn on the TV and I want to listen to the news. I want to eat a snack, like a pre-morning snack, pre, you know, breakfast. Um, But they also brought their dog. Oh, okay. So So I got up, that dog was going to bark. They were going to wake up. And I was like, Heather, just lay stiff as a board. That's all you got to do. And I did for like two hours to respect them. I just, yeah, that's what I did. (laughs) That's funny. I'm the opposite. I'm the person who uh, is like, quietly trying to knock and come into the room at like 3 a.m. whenever yeah. everyone else has already been asleep since 10 p.m. or whatever. Yeah. So, so it's a funny, we're like on the opposite. I'm like going to bed when you're getting up. Yes. Yeah. And a lot of people are like that. So it, when I, when somebody messages me right back on Instagram, cause I'll respond to them like in the morning mm-hmm. and I don't expect a response, but Marty freaking responded to me at <laughs> 3 15 this morning and I want to be like what are you doing up you must still be up like you're still up from before and we were talking Harry Potter right yeah I'm Hufflepuff that's funny he he didn't expect anything less but um that's what we were we were talking about that game and I was just can you go to sleep (laughs) can you just go to sleep and I'm on two hours uh, earlier than you two. So it really does work out like that where, uh, you know, two in the morning for me is like five for, or, or four for you. So, yeah. yeah. So sometimes I'll message you and I get a reply. I know you're up early. It's yeah. funny. I know people's routines and stuff, be, you know, being yeah. through social media and everything. But yeah. um, before I let you go, I wanted to ask one more thing. So we're expecting a big performance. It's going to be amazing. Um, the next thing I want to ask you about is about Sheffield and just like how excited you are for it, um, what your expectations are for it. And, you know, just what, what are your thoughts on the final picks that they made? Mm. And <laughs> am I sensing uh, that you, you wanted to get on the, the- well, well, I did, but it's again, I have health issues that yeah. are a priority and just like with world games, that would not have been ideal for me. Um, I would have loved it. I'm telling you, I somehow would have wanted to find a way, but I would have had to reschedule some appointments to be able to make that. And that just, I am confident. I I love the list that was selected. It's a good list. Yeah. Every person on that list is deserving. Mm -hmm. I will say that a lot of attention is towards the middleweight classes. Yeah. for women and kind of the higher weight classes for men. Um, in, in an ideal situation, I would want it to where every class was going head to head with somebody else. Like two, two per weight. Class. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, but so like maybe Jonathan Garcia. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I do think that the highlight of the women is of course Jess and Carlina, and I don't even want to pr- mispronounce her name. Ag- Agata. I, Agata. Yeah. Yeah. Agata. I don't know. Like yeah. I. Yeah. So if I mispronounce that, that's my bad. I apologize. Um, I do think that is the highlight of the women of Sheffield, mm-hmm. and I'm not gonna say that everybody else is just being overlooked now, because again, like that's a strong, strong list of women. I do feel that Jade will top joy. And that's exciting to see because yeah. I love joy. Um, but it will come down to that final deadlift. Mm-hmm. Um, I know Tiffany has been going through her own struggles with injuries. Um, so I'm excited to see what she puts up. Um, I know she will do well. She always tends to perform very well, um, especially because, you know, she's working through those injuries. Um, I, I have the highest confidence, Banika, Banika, my girl, mm-hmm. like, so if there's one person I'm standing for, it is Banika and yeah. she don't post a lot, but we talk a lot. And, um, you know, I, if I'm going to watch it's purposely for her, okay. everybody okay. else is just like entertainment, mm-hmm. but for the men, 
golly, golly. Um, Stacked. Uh, the what is it? The ninety three? Ninety three? Yeah. You should have just made Sheffield men's ninety three. <laughs> That's <laughs> yeah. what it is. Um, you know, I, I'm excited to see Jesus uh, compete in the super heavyweight. Um, I know this means a lot to him and I like watching his journey. Um, because again, another thing I mentioned to Jess, like you don't see, um, a lot of the Hispanic, you know, culture get to this point. Yeah. You know, it's, it's predominantly white and black. So it's good to see this. It's good to see such a culture that represents them. Like they are so high, strong in the representation of where they're from. So I love seeing that being brought in to this because he is very passionate. He's very passionate and doing well. He's very passionate about where he's from and he is a great representation for the sport. That's how I feel. That is my opinion. And if anybody disagrees with me, well, they're wrong. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <it's not> y'all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but Hey Zeus, like I am excited to see him perform well. Um, I do love Ray Williams and I, I do wish to see that head to head matchup. Unfortunately, it hasn't happened yet, but I do feel in the near future, it's going to have to happen. Yeah. Um, do I think he'll break Ray Williams squat uh, world record? Not this time. And I choose my words very wisely on that because when I say not this time, it puts him in a position to, you know, to eventually beat it. Yeah. Do I see him going after that total? Potentially. Yeah. But he has a very strong deadlift for a super heavyweight. Yeah. Right. And that's for amazing sure. to watch. So I think he will be challenging it. Um, and I'm back and forth on whether he's going to get it or not. And if he doesn't, it will soon fall. Yeah. And but you gotta watch out for his brother because I all I also see potentially his brother being at Sheffield one day. Yeah. Um, so great representation for the sport, great representation, you know, for the Hispanic culture. I love that for them. And for the um, U.S. Yeah, exactly. Like uh, the Mexican American, like it's yeah. you love to see it. You love to see um, that passion. And then um, that the ninety three. <laughs> it's a battle, big battle. I know who I don't want to win. I, I'm not going to say any names, but <laughs> I know who I don't want to win. And I'll just message you this name. Okay. It's fine. Recent events have made me really not like this. Person. <laughs> it's okay. And I took it personally and it had nothing to do for me, but it had stuff to do with like a very sweet boy. I care about at my gym. Okay. Um, so now I have this vendetta against this person. Okay. Um, so, but just because I don't want him to win, I don't think he's going to win anyways. All right. Like, I don't think he wanted um, uh, Jonathan to go. I don't think he wanted that because that boy, he he's very strategic too. Mm -hmm. And he don't miss a lot. Yeah. And you caught him on a non-perfect day and he's typically having a perfect day. So yeah. I'm really excited to see what he puts up because I know it's going to be good. I know it. Uh, who else? Gavin, yeah. Gavin, yeah. as long as monkeys aren't around, he'll do fine, but I don't really see this in England. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's just a stacked one. It's a stacked one. But then you saw that 93 who didn't get invited, who what just, um, he competes for New Zealand. Uh, hmm, I don't know. I have to look it up. I'm going to look it up right now. We got a fact check. We got a he, fact check. He, he just did like, he beat the world record total in that class. And I was like, really? Huh? I'm so I'm shocked. That I didn't hear. Was this, this must've been at the Commonwealth. No, this was like, um, Commonwealth games or something. It wasn't the Commonwealth one. It was, who is this? That's not who I'm looking for. What is this? Oh, 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 Gustav, right? Is he going to Sheffield? Gustav, uh, Gustav Hedlund. Yeah. What is he? Uh, yeah, he's a 93, but he's from Sweden, I believe. Oh, Sweden. I don't know why I said New Zealand. Yeah. I was thinking about Rory. Don't tell him I was thinking about him, but yeah. he is from, even the person's page I went to that posted it is a Swedish competitor. Okay, yes. Yeah. He, he broke he's that world. He, he's really good too. Um, yeah. And I mean, it's just crazy to think about how stacked that class is that. And he didn't get that invite. 
and he has a 320 kilo squat, like a mass 217.5 bench. Mm -hmm. And for deadlift, let's see, it's going to 342 and a half. Like, yeah, he's, he's, he's a legit threat. Um, you know, he came in second, uh, last mm -hmm. at the pre previous worlds that were in Sweden. Uh, he's, he's a legit threat. I mean, so, I, I was surprised he didn't get invited. Yeah. I was. Yeah. I put up um, 865, uh, in South Africa. And then it looks like he did at Europeans. He did at 840, but he missed two deadlifts. So he's got yeah. a lot left. Well, he got pushed too. Yeah. you know, he got pushed to have to be able to do this. Um, so that just stirred things up. Like now he has the world record total mm -hmm. and I didn't even remember what the world record total was in that. And I had to go to chances page and I was like, Oh, like, I mean, not by like a little bit, he broke it. Uh -huh. It was, that was cool. <laughs> yeah. So chance has done an 878. That's the current world record according uh -huh. to good lift. So this guy did more than that. Yes. Uh, I haven't seen, did he, did he do like a local meet or something? Cause it's not on open powerlifting. Um, it's not. No open powerlifting. I, his was, last thing was um, euros. He did eight forty, So he's a ways back. No, they, it just might not be uploaded. Yeah. Um, Cause, and they did end up posting it on King of the List, but King of the List posts like a bazillion times during the day. Yeah. Uh, okay. 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 I, I think I see what you're talking about now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay. Like he had an 880 total. Okay. So what was so, yeah. chance? Uh chance is 878. Yep. Oh, okay. So I don't know what I was looking at, but I mean, yeah, he just upped that. Um, yeah, still. So that would have been like that would have been listen, you if you would have just made all of Sheffield 93 kilos, you know. <laughs> I mean, it'd be still a hell of a battle. That's what's yeah. crazy about the 93s at Worlds um, yeah. is such a such a battle. Um, and then what about, you know, Delaney Wallace? I mean, he's going to be at Sheffield. Oh, what is that I face? I just love him. I just <laughs> love him so much. And all the thing about is his little dance moves and his beat in the chest thing. Yeah. Um, he's just such a good energy. Exactly. Um, so he's definitely going to bring the energy, but he's definitely someone um, that is just, he's going to put on a show. He's somebody I also speak to on and off pretty frequently. Yeah. Um, and he seems to be in very high spirits. If I had to guess, like the man that's going to come out on top, I think it's going to be Taylor Atwood. Taylor Atwood. Who would bet against him? Me. Cause I'm a, I'm a realist. <laughs> yeah. So if it came down to a point where I really thought like, Hey, you know what? Yeah. I mean, I, I do believe that Taylor is going to put on a great performance and I think he will come out on top. Mm -hmm. And I think for the women, I think it's going to be, um, I think it's going to be Leah. I know how bad Amanda wants it, mm -hmm. but Amanda just ain't getting it. You don't think? <laughs> no. Based on what? Just Leah, based off of her Arnold performance, right? Mm -hmm. She still had some left in the tank, and I know that she was dealing with an injury, but she bounced back pretty quick. Um, and again, like, of course, like I want Amanda to do well. Of course. But, um, you know, I just, I think it really got into, I, I think it got into her head when she didn't win best overall female lifter at Worlds. So it's something that showed us, oh, you can be beat, and you got beat by 47. <laughs> So I was really happy for tip there because you're showing out for the, the smaller girls. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's hard to bet against Taylor Atwood, but it's not hard to bet against Amanda. Right. Okay. Because okay. you do have such strong, strong women in this sport. It's and I love tight. watching the women because of that. Yeah, they, they're great. And Leah, what was it? 600? Yeah, uh, Leah has her totals are crazy. She's, she's 565, 565 and 548. So, yeah, I mean, so Leah has the advantage of the fact that the 69 kilo uh, world record total is 548, and yeah. she did a 556 at yeah. 63. Yeah. So imagine her with no weight cut. Points, yeah. If they're going by good lift points, I think, I think Leah is hard to touch right now 
Well, they're going at, uh, at uh, Sheffield on the percentage that you break the world record by. And like I said, she, the world That's record, right. the world record that she's going to break is the 69 kilo weight class, which is lower right. than the 63. So I so forgot about kinda, that. She's kind of got it set up for her to. Yeah. I was thinking about that. Sheffield with the, uh, the winner take all. Um, so I don't know, yeah. maybe a 93 will win overall. It's tough. I mean, I think, no, again, it's because, you know, Taylor has not ever done his best performance at worlds and pushed the world record up very high. So the world record's super low, That's right. 790. So I think it's the deck is kind of stacked for Leah and Taylor. Yeah. And I do believe that. That's my two bets. Yeah. It would kind of be like a uh, pretty shocking, but I mean, the, some of these other weight classes though, they're just so cool. Like the 76 with, uh, had, yeah. Like yes. And Agatha and Carlina, I, like yeah, what a great Carlina, pick to throw in Carlina. Carlina really now Carlina might challenge Leah. Cause she, she broke it heavily. Um, yeah. that was another, I was like, Whoo. Um, I like Carlina. I like her. She's a very nice person. So I was really glad I knew she was going to get that invite. Um, but she was one of the ones I was excited to get that invite for. Mm -hmm. So if I had to guess like who would play second to Leah, it'd be Carlina and then maybe Amanda, because while I think Amanda may break her world record, it won't be by a lot. Yeah. 636 and a half is her, uh, world record. And then if we look at what she did, she did 615 at worlds. Yeah. So, so yeah, I mean, that's a tough, that's a tough one. Um, I think she'll probably break it. I think a lot of these people are going to break their world records and stuff, but it's just like, how much are you going to break it by? Yeah. She already, uh, with that battle with her and Daniela, they already pushed that world record up so high before, and then she chipped it again, um, you know, in 2021. So yeah, yeah and it's a high like, one. Um, you know, South Africa didn't go as planned for her, which, mm -hmm. I mean, we, we are all subjected to those days, right? Unfortunately, it was on a world stage. Um, I did. I do think that lit a fire under Amanda because she wanted that overall. She just didn't get it. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's what she wants again. But that's where strategy comes in. Mm -hmm. And if you are lacking in that part, you're just not going to, you're not going to perform as well as you want to. We, yeah. we in there too so and like you said i mean like the the, the deck is kind of stacked because leah has that really low world record to, to break mm -hmm. in the 69s but cool i mean we're all excited about sheffield so i wanted to bring yeah. it up you know we talk about um uh, powerlifting american nationals but like we we have a big contingent of our team that's going to be at sheffield and yeah. so we obviously we want all of usa every, stacked. yeah we want I think we, everybody on the u.s team is going to do well yeah. I do believe that. I do believe that everybody with Powerlifting America is going to do great. Just because my predictions don't have them does not mean I think they're going to do poorly. Yeah. Um, I do think they are going to do very well. Um, and I mean, again, like most of them, most of them um, are great representations to the sport. Yeah, absolutely. Unfortunately, I cannot say all. <laughs> of course, of course. There, there's always some bad apples. Well, <laughs> Um, last thing I want to ask you about is, uh, you just launched recently, like in the last month or mm -hmm. so, um, your own coaching, uh, or what is it? Co coaching company, uh, breakthrough performance and nutrition. Yeah. And so tell us just a little bit about what that's all about. It's like your yeah, So, um, I do coach powerlifting. I coach face-to-face -face people as well in powerlifting. Um, so my spaces for online are very limited because my face-to-face -face does take a lot of my time, which is why I get up at three o'clock in the morning mm -hmm. and we'll be leaving there shortly. But I also, um, wanted to be able to help powerlifters out a little bit more. Again, all these years of experience in the uh, field of powerlifting, I have seen, some drastic weight cuts. I've seen performances just go poorly because of nutrition. So I dedicated a lot of my time, like before France, before South Africa, like everything has been building up to this, um, to make sure I could dedicate myself to being able to properly help people more, because that's all I want out of life is to be able to educate and help people as much as I can. Um, so that's why I wanted to offer nutrition. So at least I know whoever I was helping, they were doing it in a safe and healthy manner, right? 
Um, because that's my number one goal as a coach to make sure that my, my coaching mannerisms and my goals for these people are to be able to get them to where they want to be in a healthy, uninjured and safe way. Um, because under my guidance, I'm not going to let somebody just like drastically cut 12 pounds in like two days and then wonder why their performance wasn't well. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. for me, like I'm, I'm very informative with my athletes like if I had them change up something in their training or if I'm changing something in their nutrition, I give very detailed descriptions as to why I am doing this. And this is what you may feel when it is this way, but it's not going to be this way for long. Um, because a lot of people, they, they need that sense of understanding. And I feel like they do better when they understand mm -hmm. instead, like, cause some people are afraid to ask those questions. Like, well, why are we doing this? Mm -hmm. So for me, I just go ahead and explain it while I'm showing it to them. And, um, with Amy, I had to cut her for her competition to PA, um, her first powerlifting America competition. She weighed in right where she needed to nine for nine day performance okay. wasn't affected. Like it was in the past with other people doing her nutrition. Um, so it's really just something I like to give back to the sport. Um, and I do appreciate you mentioning that. And, I will mention this because Breakthrough Performance and Nutrition is going to be sponsoring this. Um, I will be making a post about it later, but anybody that is competing at Powerlifting American Nationals with Game Day Barbell, I have or will be paying for X amount of day passes. So oh. anybody that's competing there, all they have to say is I'm competing at Powerlifting American Nationals and they will have that free day pass. Okay sponsored by me. So, um, again, that's something I didn't need to do, but I wanted to do to make sure. So, and, and didn't really have to worry about paying something. So whatever I can do to give back to the sport, that's, that's what this whole business is about helping that's others. And I mean, and it is a business too. Like, yeah. I know you're super thorough. So I know like you went through all the steps. This is not just like an Instagram account yeah. of a good, <laughs> a good lifter, make an Instagram account, trying to cash right. and make money. Like you actually did all the legwork to start an actual legit That's business. Right. Well, I made the conversation today. Um, you know, my goal is to not take your money. Mm -hmm. I mean, you do see a lot of cash grabs on here, but uh, one client in particular, like they aren't doing what they are supposed to, right? And this isn't the first time I've spoken to this person. It's not the third time I've spoken to this person. So it's going to get to the point where while their month ends, I'm going to let them know that if they can't start taking accountability, if they can't start doing what they paid me for and do their part, then our services are done, right? I try to give people chances, but at the end of the day, I don't need the money like that. I'm not going to keep taking your money for no reason. If you're paying me, I want to be able to offer you a service that is benefiting you. Um, and sometimes it's hard for people. It's just like those people that get YMCA memberships and they never go, but this money's just falling out of their pocket. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like they're still withdrawing that money. I don't want to do that for them. And if I'm not the person that can help them, I will guide them to somebody that may be able to do that for them. But, you know, they're filling a spot for somebody that really does want to put in the work. Yeah. Um, so it, it is what it is. It's nothing personal. At the end of the day, it's a business thing, but we have to take accountability as coaches and athletes. They got to do the same thing is, you know, yeah. you got to have that relationship. And I do feel like this woman wants to do well. Um, she's just, she's not being honest with herself mm -hmm. and coaches usually can see when they're not being very honest with themselves, but you're a yeah. very honest person. So you're not just going to keep taking your money. If it's not going to work. Yeah. Like, I don't want to do that. You know, I, I'm going to save you the, the $75. And I'm going to let you on your way. <laughs> yeah. So again, because you're taking the spot where somebody could be really spending $75 and getting, you know, whatever from it. And it's worth your time to put yeah. into that athlete as well. Cause your time is limited as well, which I know we're, we're going up against your deadline here. Um, do you have other sponsors that you want to shout out or coaches or anything else, anyone else that you want to shout out before we get off this? Um, obviously I'm going to shout out Pete Spence with SBD apparel. Um, if you're looking for the gear, that's the gear that you want to get. Um, every other one sucks. Just kidding, but definitely <laughs> with <the> SBD. Yeah, <laughs> quality, yeah. quality material there. Um, of course, performance, 
uh, training with Kedrick and Alfred and them. They do offer online powerlifting coaching as well as nutrition. Great people. They've helped world-class athletes get to the top end of stages, mm -hmm. right? Um, Power Build Lifting Club with Colin Whitney. Um, he offers like a whole bunch of resources and workouts for free. So if you are in a financial situation to where you can't afford a online coach, he does have online free workouts just available for you. Mm -hmm. So got to shout out those three people, of course. Yeah, for sure. And with the SPD, um, is there, uh, if someone goes like to your bio on Instagram, can they, is it, do you have like a link or something that? Yeah, I do have a support yeah. link that support they link. can okay. directly go to. Um, and then again, like if you're face to face with me at the gym and you are struggling financially, I will donate items to you because I want you to do great at your first competition. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's so, a perk. Higher breakthrough yeah. performance and nutrition. You might get some <laughs> hand-me-down uh, SPD gear. That's right. That's right. If it's just sitting around like, and I can help you, I'm going to help you. It's always good to give back to the sport that's done so much for me. Um, I've been afforded a lot in the sport. So the, the best I can do is just give back when I can. So again, awesome. if you're competing at Powerlifting American Nationals and you need to get a lift in, Go to game day barbell. You will have a free pa day pass there for you. And that will be posted later. So, so, so cool. <laughs> All right. Well, that's everything, Heather. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to join us here. You're the oh, second course. guest on the new power of the America podcast. So thank you so much. And thank you to everyone that listens to this. And with that, we're out of here. Peace. Peace. I'll see you soon, Paul. <laughs>